truckloads of sand onto the street. The water was less than three feet from the top of the breakwater. Water was hitting the houses on Front Street with such force, it twisted off gas and water connections. Trees were toppled. The sidewalk cement was heaved off. Huge craters were gouged into the earth. Butson's house was taking the full impact of the current. The water was so strong that it just, the pressure just lifted the house away. And uh, everybody was in shock at that point because the Butsons had not taken anything out, at all out. Their dog was left in the house because everybody figured, well, it's not going to come that high. When it went off, it went through and took Dad's garage with it. Took my brother's whole Ford car. It, we found it halfway down the street, buried in sand. But I guess the house went down, and when it hit the, the button, the center button of the Wellington Street Bridge, it kind of smashed up. So there was nothing left of that, just the foundation. Grandpa never got upset. He was quite calm then. He thought it out. See, there it is. It's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. Maybe they, maybe they kept it inside themselves for a while. I don't know. At Bruffdale, the river was still rising. Although the university was never evacuated, Students were sent home early from classes. So we walked down, and the, the, the water was obviously raised a great deal at the bridge. And when we got down on Richmond Street, the water was coming right up uh, just north of the university entrance. There was uh, several men and a dog out in a boat in the middle of the, of the street. And uh, there was a, a chap carrying his dog out of the house. and. Uh, uh, it was obviously a, a very serious situation. They were actually rowing across hedges along Bernard Avenue. And they had a, our, we had fortunately built our house up rather high and terraced it around it. So they came, rowed up to almost to the top of the terrace and took my wife and our two dogs and proceeded to leave me there because they were going to pick up a some older citizens along Bernard Avenue, which they did. The river had reclaimed its old course, and Aubrey Federley's home was in its path. The current that had torn away Butson's frame cottage was now ripping away the earth from the mansion's foundation. Federley had a heart attack and had to be taken to the hospital in a fire truck. An ambulance couldn't get through the water. We took the bus home from South Collegiate and the route came down York Street and going over that bridge to Stanley Street, the water was almost up to the roadbed and then we became very serious. Like before we saying, oh, we might not get home from school and thought it was kind of like a joke. When we got off the bus at Warncliffe Road and started down Springbank Drive, ha we got to the top of the hill and we could see in front of us just this grayness all where there should be a whole bunch of houses in a road, there was just this grayness. And so I'm standing at the edge of this water, looking at a car with six inches of the roof sticking out of the water and wondering whose car it was. And I knew the car very well because it's my uncle's car. Like Reynolds, Don Gore returned from school to find his home flooded and his family stranded. Two of his teenaged friends offered to help out. I was standing there and Ken Black came along. He said, Don, we're making a canoe. We're building this thing, and it's not done yet, but we think that it's waterproof. And so Keith and I went back and got the canoe on, the, on a baby buggy frame and uh, took it down there and pulled it down by rope. He pushed and steered it, and I got down there, and we put it in the water, got in, got the paddles going. The water was just coming in there. It's like uh, you, you filling a basin. You know, from one side, it was just tearing in there. And it took a boat, I would say, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to get down there. They were coming sideways. And they were getting over too far where the fence posts were. And I thought, I kept hollering, just go back out, so they would come back out again. And I said, if, if you hit those fence posts, it'll tear the bottom out. Well, nobody could swim. They all behaved pretty good in the canoe. 
got them all back, including the dog, too. He, he was behaved, too. Ken Black was playing hooky that afternoon. When his principal found out, he suspended punishment. Shortly before 5 o'clock, the river in West London was a few inches from the top of the breakwater. Kingsley Ferguson was riding his bike home from school. I had heard nothing. I, I thought it would be the same river that I left. And it really was. When I got to Blackfriars Bridge, uh, it, everything looked rather deserted. I knew then that the river was extremely high, but it didn't seem all that much higher than the morning. And Blackfriars Bridge was dry, as I remember it. I went across. Blackfriars Street was dry. I went down the two blocks past Wilson to Albion, turned left on Albion Street, all dry, street was deserted, and uh, I thought I'd find out my family at home. Um, but the door was locked, there was no sign of life, there were no people around, and uh, after making sure there was nobody there, I got back on my bike. At the same time, Albert Flood was driving his cab into the area to pick up a fare. Red, Red Davis? He was ahead of me. He went over ahead of me. We get in there, we get in the water. He was a bit deaf, and I didn't realize it. Eh? He pulled old Red. I hollered at him, I said, hey, pull the throttle out in that old car. I think he had a Graham, an old Graham. And he said, hey? Couldn't hear. <laughs> over on Edith Street, Norma Welch's father was returning from work. When Dad got home, they thought there's no big problem. There was no water around the house, you know, so they decided to cook supper. And uh, Ruth Braley came running up the road saying, the bank has broken, everybody get out now. So we started throwing the dog, the cat, the kittens, the canary, the coats, everything in the car. <laughs> and they just got up around Mount Pleasant Hill when the water was coming in the bottom of the doors of the car. So they just got out. At 5 p.m., the river overran the breakwater near Blackfriars Bridge. A second break soon appeared near Dundas Street. Within the hour, the Thames River would be flowing across its entire length. Kingsley Ferguson was riding right into it. I started noticing the water coming up from Dundas Street. And it got high enough that I uh, couldn't see the curbs any longer. I didn't know where the curbs were. And I uh, took a chance on bumping down and bumping up again, but I missed the bump up and blew out both tires. The full force of both branches of the river where they meet at Dundas Bridge uh, was coming across into the park. So by the time I got just below the bridge on my way out, um, I guess I was in trouble. The old car was just idling over, eh? And of course, it just sucked the water right up the tailpipe, eh? Right into the muffler. <laughs> Goodbye. She went clunk, bing, bang, and that was the end of that. Yeah. So I pushed him out of there. We got to run at that Dundas Street Bridge, well, the Kennington Bridge it was then. Cease French is standing. He's a cop. A uh, good guy, too, he was. Oh, he's waving his arms like a maniac. He's standing there, he's hollering, go back, go back. Well, do you think we're going back in that water? Gee, no way. Police had closed off the Dundas Bridge because it was shifting from the force of the current. Despite the danger, flood refugees made their way across. It was the only way out of West London. I don't know whether they were firemen or just people standing around. <clears throat> came down to meet me and dragged me through the rest of the uh, water back up the bridge and then gave me hell for having gone into that area. And I said, he said, uh, didn't you see the guards on the bridge? And I said, there were no guards on the bridge, not Blackfriars Bridge. Apparently, they left that out of their calculations. Edith Callow and her three children had evacuated their home early and had gone to stay at a friend's house in South London. And meanwhile, my father couldn't come. And nobody could tell him what had happened to us. Anyhow, the uh, police were there, and they wouldn't let anybody in, into the area. So my father gave us a famous old English oath and dashed to the policeman 
and caught a boat and went over to the house. Many of the people were on the roofs of their houses. And here they were sitting up on the roof, hollering for help, or some of them were firing shotguns to attract attention. I rode up Warncliff Road uh, to just about Mount Pleasant, and here was somebody else waving out of an upstairs window. The entrance was wide enough for me to roll into the vestibule of the home and tie the boat to a banister. Uh, and they walked down from upstairs, walked down the steps, got into the boat without getting their feet wet. Cease French, who had failed to stop Albert Flood from crossing the Dundas Bridge, entered West London to help rescue anyone and anything he could. They were in the boat, and they saw this dog in the window. And uh, it was by Will Klopp's door there. And uh, it was thrashing around in the window. So they decided they'd just ram it and get the dog out, which they did. Boy Scouts were called in to assist exhausted police officers by directing traffic and warding off looters. London's mayor drove the homeless to emergency shelters. An employee from Labatt's Brewery left his job early to help out in West London. During one rescue attempt, he stepped out of his boat into what he thought was a shallow patch of water. He fell right into an open manhole. And the hip waders filled immediately with water and pulled him down. And I remember at the age of 13, as I was at that time, uh, being quite horrified to hear that his body had been found at the foot of the steps of the, the house next door to us that we moved into. Uh, shortly after the flood, it had washed from the field a distance maybe of 300 to 300 yards and, uh, and ended up there. So that, uh, that brought a, one of the tragedies fairly close to home in my impressionable mind, age 13. Joseph Britton was 37. He left behind a wife and four children. Refugees began to pour into evacuation centers. Public schools that had sent children home a few hours earlier now took in their entire families. They looked glassy-eyed and just staring, you know, and you go like this in front of their eyes, and they, they wouldn't even blink. They just stood there, and the children, the ones I really felt sorry for were the children because they didn't know what the heck was happening to them. The river peaked at 23 feet above its regular level at 3 in the morning, the highest level ever recorded. The remainder of the flood flowed southwest, wrenching homes in Kilworth off their foundations, washing out two-thirds of Thamesville, and threatening Chatham's main bridge before the river emptied into Lake St. Clair. Less than 24 hours after it started, the flood of 1937 was over. And you couldn't see Tecumseh Park. Couldn't even see the stands. The fences, where were they? Ten feet underwater. They were buried. Just buried. Over 5,000 Londoners were homeless. Property damage was in the millions. The city's water supply.